if I can take care of the little birds, if I'm taking care of thee, look, the, look how I clothe the little birds. And if I can do that to them, surely you should have a system to know that I'm going to take care of people who are made in my image. With Jesus, I can make it. With him, I know I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to be with us. Stand by us during this time of this message. We thank you for allowing us to see another Palm Sunday as you headed into Jerusalem, letting the world know that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Be with us during this time of this message. May this message penetrate those who need to hear it. Convict, convert, and sanctify our lives until we all be thine. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, those of you who have your Bibles, I'm going to do just the opposite. Rather than going to old and new, I'm going to go with the new and the old because the last shall be first and the first shall be last type set up. I want you to look at those scriptures that was read beautifully by Sister Dorothy and her mother and all, um, as it relates to Jesus coming in on a donkey. Some of you all remember that story. If you were literally inside this building today, the Stenesis would have had palm trees. They would have been on all of these branches and they would have been all up here palm leaves would have been everywhere and all on the altar and all up on the pulpit and all on the pulpit seat and all the people in the church would be waving a palm waving a palm saying Hosanna Hosanna to the king it's that Sunday today traditionally known as Palm Sunday and you know Palm Sunday commemorates uh, the Sunday before Jesus' crucifixion amen you see, on this Palm Sunday, you all, Jesus made his final trip to Jerusalem. He would not move and leave Jerusalem, y'all, again, until he was killed, buried, and risen from the dead. So let's take a look at this thing called the triumphal entry of the Palm Sunday, because that's what it's called, the triumphal entry. Here, Jesus uh, wanted the world to know to let them know that he was the Messiah and that he was the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16 tells us that. But the triumphal entry was something else as well. For Jesus was dramatically warning the people that they must change their concept as to who he really was. You see, the people were thinking one thing uh, as it relates to waiting, looking for the Messiah. Uh, and uh, Jesus wanted him to see another. Amen? So if you notice the scene that Dorothy, you know, talked about so uh, beautifully a while ago, it says the scene involved uh, a, a coat which symbolizes that Jesus came in what? Peace. Notice he didn't ride in on nothing that wasn't peace. He took a coat which symbolized Jesus came in in peace. And if you notice that, you can find that fulfillment of scripture in the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. For there we read, uh, the, the, the king cometh, sent upon a coat. And the Messiah was coming not as a conquering riding on a white stallion, but as a king of peace riding on a young coat. Well, anyway, you all remember that story. And then Jesus told him, two of his disciples to go ahead and, and uh, if you find this coat, 
go and tell them that the Lord has need of them. And they found the donkey and they got permission to take it to Jesus. And when they got the donkey back to Jesus, they put the tonic on it and made a Sabbath. Then Jesus got out of the donkey, got on the donkey, and rode it into Jerusalem. Now, this seems strange to us that Jesus rode a donkey into town. But he had his reason. You see, Jesus, you all, riding a donkey into Jerusalem was the fulfillment, once again, of the Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. So who was this Messiah? Well, again, I'm glad you asked. The Messiah was to be God's delivered promises for centuries. And one of the prophecies, once again, found indebted with this triumphal entry was in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. That was written about 500 years, y'all, before Palm Sunday. Amen? So if y'all remember the story, I'm not going to dwell on it, but I have to tell a little bit about it, tell you a little bit about it, because today is Palm Sunday. And if you all remember, when Jesus rode in, on this donkey, they rode uh, on this coat. Uh, the crowd went nuts. They went crazy. They saw Jesus coming like a parade riding in. These folks went completely berserk. And they just couldn't believe it. And they took palm branches and spread them on the road. And they waved branches in the air because they were so excited. And they started shouting. And they started raising their voices. And they started praising God and saying, Hosanna, 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 Hosanna in the highest. And, and so what that did was that excited people. But yet, later on, that same crowd was saying that Friday morning, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You see, my brothers and sisters, isn't that interesting how quick people can change? Come on now. Isn't that interesting? One minute they are one way, and another minute they are another way. You see, what? You need to ask yourself, no, wait a minute now. Earlier that Sunday, you all were saying, Hosanna! Five days later, that crowd changed. Well, remember now, I've got to do a little teaching here because I'm a teaching preacher. There's two Greek words for crowd. A multitude. Whenever you see the word in the New Testament, and the crowd of the multitude, one Greek word for crowd is the word uh, oxlos. O-X-L-O-S. Oxlos, uh, oxlos. Oxlos the definition for the English definition of oxlos is the word fickle. The y'all know some folk that are fickle. Don't raise your hand. Don't tell us who they are. Just, just know there's some folk that are fickle. One minute they up, next minute they down, next minute they mad, next minute they glad, next minute they happy, next minute they excited, next minute they mad. Fickle, fickle people. You never know what side they're on. And this is what happened to this crowd, the Oxlots. Hosanna! On Sunday now, on Sunday, Hosanna! And five days later, that same Oxlots of fickle people said crucify him. Amen? But the other Greek word for crowd, C-R-O-W-D, is the word laos, L-A-O-S, laos. Laos is where we get the English word laity. A lay people, a laity. It literally means the people of God. Well, now wait a minute, brother. Wait a minute, brother. Y'all hold up, y'all. Hold up, hold up. Hold up, hold up, y'all. Hold up. Wait a minute. They couldn't be layoffs because if they were layoffs, they would not be changing their mind if they were connected to God. Layoffs are the people that's connected to God. So they couldn't have been the crowd couldn't have been the layoffs because the layoffs meaning people of God, would not have tried to crucify God. So it could have been layoffs. So they must have been obsolete because they were fickle. So, Palm Sunday, John, hold that up! Five days later, same crowd, crucify him. Amen? So I just want to let you know that 
Which crowd are you? Are you the Laos? Or are you the Oxlos? God is looking for us to be the people of God, particularly in this day and time, particularly during this pandemic. God is looking for the layoffs to stand up and be the people of God that we need to be, checking on people, doing whatever we can to try to get everybody through together this, through this pandemic. So I just wanted to just share just a little bit. There's no way in the world I'm going to allow Palm Sunday to get in here without talking about Palm Sunday. But my main focus today is coming from 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. And I want you all to look at that, 1 Samuel chapter 30, 1 through 6. And I won't find your Bibles now. You can still do that in between you drinking your coffee, in between you eating your cinnamon roll, uh, uh, in between you eating your potato pie, because you know, Sunday, you know, it's not, it's not uh, a fasting time during this 40 days of Lent. So some of y'all can eat your tater pie, and you can go and eat your banana pudding. So in between all of that, your, your mouths of that and bring you some nice hot coffee. Go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 through 6. And if you notice the sixth verse, and Dr. read it beautifully, simply says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. How many of you all know as we go through this pandemic, there may be times when your loved ones may not be around you wherever you are, even in the house. But they, even if they are there, they may not be able to help you. And the Bible says sometimes that's where God wants you to be so you can depend on God so that you can, he wants you to encourage yourself in the Lord. So during this COVID-19, uh, this coronavirus, the subject is encourage yourself in the Lord. Well, by way of introduction, I want to introduce it a little bit. Uh, allow me to define the word encourage. Encourage is defined as to fill with courage or strength or purpose, especially in preparation for a hard task. In preparation for a hard task. Let me, let me on the other hand, let me ask you all uh, something about the opposite of encourage is what? Discourage. Let me ask you something about discourage. Y'all can say what you want to. It's not a good feeling to be discouraged. Can I get a witness in here? It's not a good feeling to be discouraged. Amen? In fact, you know, you feel like throwing in the tide. That's discouraging. You feel like giving up. Would you agree that that's discouraging? Your back is absolutely against the wall. That's encouragement. I mean, discouragement. I'm concerned about my bills, and I'm concerned about this, I'm concerned about that, I'm concerned about my grandkids, I'm not able to hug them anymore, I'm not able to do the kissy-kissy and everything like that anymore. That can be discouraging. When folks smile in your face and stab you in your back, that's discouragement. When you find out that person you thought that was your friend, right. you discover that he or she is not your friend. That's discouraging. Amen? When you thought you passed the class at Jackson State and he ended up flunking, <laughs> that's, come on now, discouraging. Amen? When you've been hurt, I hate to say it, by a Christian, that's sure enough, this curse. What I'm trying to say to you, my brothers and sisters, it's not a good feeling to be discouraged. Can I get a witness? That's why all of us, sometimes our friends and loved ones are not around. That's why it's very intrinsic, that's very, and very essential for all of us, all of us to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Well, in our text, in this peripheral, in 1 Samuel chapter 31 through 3, David found himself in a strange predicament. Verse 1 says, look at the verse. I told you all to look at your Bibles at home. Come on, you should be following me now. And on 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 6. Look at notice it said, uh, 
in the text in verse 1. The Amalekites had invaded the south and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. Oh my. And had taken the woman of the women, shall I say, captives and carried them away. Now, preacher, what in the world are you talking about when you say Zig, Z I G Z I G L A G, Ziglag? Where is Ziglag? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, my sister, I don't know what to do. I'm so glad you had Chelsea. I don't know what to do. Ziklag was a place where David and his army made their home, musicians. And according to God, the Hebrew language, Ziklag was a place of God's blessing for David and his men. And now the enemy had destroyed it by fire and taken captive their wives and their children. Now, you can say what you will or you can say what you may. David and his army, because of that, was discouraged. Amen? Amen? If your wife and your children were dead of mission, you too would be discouraged. Amen? Well, it was the Amalekites, if you will, who were evil people that burned down Ziklag and kidnapped all the wives and children. Now, the father of the Amalekites was was Amalek, whose name means in the Hebrew language, the people that licks up and takes away all. Now, as quiet as this kept, Amalek, Amalek had been on the scene in the Old Testament a very long time ago. He was the same rascal who had been fighting the nation of Israel as far back as Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. And now that rascal is trying his best to destroy and ultimately kill David. Well, according to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 5, David, not but one, but two wives. You can get away with that thing, John. <laughs> John is <laughs> not one, but two wives. Amen? Oh, I had to pause because you're only your best one yourself. I'm thinking about that two wives. Trying to love two. Ain't, 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 uh, ain't easy to do. I remember going, when you try to love two, ain't easy to do. I got to walk at home. Sleeping for me, put a woman on the outside. It's crazy about me. Just come. <laughs> all I know is, I don't know the rest of it, but all I know is, trying to love too ain't easy to do. <laughs> Listen, y'all, you're only your best when you're yourself. <laughs> who wrote trying to love too easy to do? Who wrote that? Come on, now, who wrote that, y'all? Who wrote it? Who? Okay, let's figure out. All I'm saying is it's a song. And don't y'all act like y'all been ready to take communion today that y'all don't know what I'm talking about when I said trying to love too ain't easy to do. Amen. All right, then. I'm going to move on. But anyway, he had two wives, and not one, but both of his wives end up being in a little trouble. And he started losing them. And all, you, all I'm going to say is, uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, that uh, that's discouraging. Did y'all figure it out? Well, anyway, according to David, uh, these persons were taken captive. His first wife's name was Haya Noam in the Hebrew. How spell it? A H I N O A M. In the Hebrew, it really means grace and and beauty. And his second wife's name was Abigail, which means the source of joy. Both wives, both wives, both wives, wow, these two people brought that beautiful, beautiful grace and joy to David. Y'all will get that maybe later on when you relook at it again. I gave you what the Hebrew uh, was for both of them, right? And I'm simply saying to you, both of those wives brought beauty, talking about their name, grace, right, and joy to David. Amen. They were now gone. Again, you say what you want to, that's discouraging. 
In fact, it is verse 4. When you look at verse 4, it says, where the discouragement set in. There we read in verse 4, to show the encourage, discouragement set in. Notice, then David and the people that were with them lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. You see, the Jerusalem translation renders it another way. Look at what this translation says. They wept aloud till they were too weak to weep anymore. I said they wept aloud until they were too weak to weep anymore. Amen? It's not a good feeling to be discouraged. Well, there's a few points, and I'm not going to hold you too much longer, that I would like to use today on this Palm Sunday that I hope that would bless you during this pandemic of the COVID-19. First thing I want to say to you, uh, when you're discouraged from time to time, number one, um, this is what, I hate to say it, but these are some things to ponder. When you really need people, that's the time some will turn their back on you. Can I get a witness in here? Can I get a witness all over the world that you say it right now? When you really need people, that's the time some will turn their back on you. Oh, I know you're not saying that, bro. Yes, I watch this. Watch this. According to the text in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6, notice, because of what David's men found after they got back from fighting a hard, rough, tough war and found their wives and children gone, you got it. They blamed David. Now, David was with them. He didn't have nothing to do with it, but he, he and David fought for these people. The man is a warrior ever since he was a little bit of a thing, ever since he was a teenager. He was the same David. He's the same man that said you know, when the others could not do it, coward or otherwise, David said, I can slay Goliath. It's the same little young teenage boy, David. And when he got back out there, he told Goliath, you come with the sword and you come with, it, with the job and everything in your hand. But he said, I come in the name of Jesus. And a little simple praise shot and some small stone, and he hit him dead in the back. And David was scared. He was scared because he ran toward Goliath, not away from Goliath. This is the same man, and he hit him, and he did right in the forehead, killed him, cut off his head, brought him back to Saul. And that's when the people had a lot of respect for that young man at that point. To the point that Saul got jealous of him because he heard the chanting from the people. And the chanting said, throughout, imagine this now, you are all over Jerusalem, and you hear all of this chanting. Saw, saw, saw slain thousands, but David, David, tens of thousands. Saw, saw, you slain a few thousands, but David, David, tens of thousands. He got jealous of it, and he wanted to kill him. Amen? So I want to let you know, this is the same person, this is the same David, that brought the folk through all of this stuff. But because those folk discovered that their wives and children were missing, who did they blame? They blamed David. The point was, when you really need people, that's the time some will turn their back on you. Can I get a witness in here? Amen? Amen? So they wanted to kill David. My God, do you know some people like that because they don't quite know what's going on. They can't blame nobody else, so they're going to blame you. Am I, the only, look here, look here. Am I the only one? Some folk, I mean, Paul's parenthetically and say, needs to take the blame who is not taking the blame right now during this coronavirus. Two and a half months. Two and one half months. Two and a half months, number 44 plus one, knew exactly what was going on. He knew it this coronavirus started in 2017. It was first detected in 2017. Other countries, when it started hitting as an epidemic, started getting on top of it. They started. Our president 
44 plus 1. Simply said to us, I'm just talking about 44 plus 1, that it was a host of the Democrats and the media. And he waited two and a half months to do anything. Now, he's not God, and I know he's not God, so I'm not blaming him on that, because you can't stop him. Nothing God wants not to stop. Can I get a witness in here? Only God going to be able to stop the virus. But we still could have been a little bit better prepared. Maybe we would have had a little bit more, what are those things? No? Ventilators. Maybe we would have had a few more, maybe we would have been a little bit better prepared if our person, but he doesn't want to take the blame for it. But anyway, they blamed David, and David didn't do this. Amen? So why did they do this to David? He had, he had, again, absolutely nothing to do with it. He was out there fighting the war, just like the rest of them. You see, my Christian friend, people will turn their back on you. Can I get a witness in here? Negroes will turn on you and you have to do, you can say what you will of they, they will turn their backs on you. Then you have to ask yourself, wait a minute, was this really a friend? Is this a true friend? Listen, we are pickled people. We are fickle. We are fickle. We are people who are fickle. And we've been fickle ever since Adam and Eve, our foreparents, ate of the forbidden fruit and not the apple. Amen? Isaiah chapter 7, 40 says it best. Verse 7 and 8. The grass withers and the flower fades, and the breath of God blows upon it. Should there be people in the of the grass? The grass withers and the flower fades away, but the word of God shall stand forever. Amen? Well, what I'm trying to do is we wrap this thing up. After David's own men tried to kill him, he became discouraged. Amen? He had no friends, no loved ones around him. No church members, no choir members, no fraternity brothers, no sorority sisters, no one. The only thing that he could do was encourage himself in the Lord. I just said something very important. Sometimes in your life, the only thing you can do is encourage yourself in the Lord. Verse 6 says, David encouraged himself in Yahweh, the action God. Now, the word encouraged comes from the Hebrew word shazak, S-C-H-A-Z-A-Q, which means to strengthen and harden yourself to become courageous, to be firm and resolute. It means to be courageous. It means to harden yourself. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be down, down sometimes, but when you're down, this word means for you to harden yourself. So it reminds us, uh, if you keep in your hand on this on this wooden pulpit, after a while, if you keep going, it'll start to harden around there. Amen? It'll start hardening itself. That's what encouraging yourself means. So now, how we respond to difficult situations determines the level of success that we have in our own life. I just said something very important. How we respond to difficult times determines the level of success that we have in life. Amen? So, the bottom line is, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. says it best, as we get ready to wrap up here, he says the ultimate measure of a man or woman is not where they stand in times of comfort and convenience, but rather where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. You see, our ability to encourage and strengthen ourselves in difficult times is in proportionate to the measure of intimacy we pose with the Lord. Listen, the closer you walk with Yahweh, the more positive your life and attitude will be. I just said something important. The more, the closer you walk with the Lord, the more better your relationship with God will be. Can I get a witness in here? So encourage yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Encourage yourself. Look when you, when your back is against the wall, encourage yourself. So that's what David had to do. He had to depend on the Lord. He had nowhere to go, nowhere to turn but Yahweh. You see, my Christian friends in life, there will be times that you will also have nowhere to go, 
nowhere to go but Yahweh, which is God. And so in conclusion, look at verse 8. Notice, David turned his attention to the only one that could truly help him during the time of need. How many of y'all know that we're in a time of need right now? You can't go and talk to the governor. You can't go and talk to number 44 plus 5 plus 1. You can't talk to all of these people. The only thing you can talk to is God. Amen? You can only do that to God. Notice verse 8. Notice, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after the troops? Shall I overtake them? And he, being Yahweh, answered him. He said, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover everything. Oh. Can I get a witness in here? Isn't that something? My, my, my. You see, David was encouraged by this positive affirmation from Yahweh, from the Lord. And consequently, David left Ziglag with 600 men in full pursuit of the Amalekite. And even though they had some setbacks on the way to the battle, David was never discouraged. He trusted once he heard from the Lord. He trusted in Yahweh. In life, I'm saying the same thing to us. We need to understand in life there are some setbacks. You know, as I often say all the time, a setback is a setup for a comeback. Right. I just said something. A setback is nothing but a setup for a comeback. Amen? Amen. That's all it is. Well, at the end of the text in verse 11, Yahweh, as usual, <laughs> you got it, war. Notice verse 11. Notice, David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken. He also refused what? His two wives. Nothing of theirs was what? Missing from the youngest to the what? Oldest. He recovered his wife. Nothing from the youngest to the oldest was missing, including the sons and daughters of all the plunder the Amalekites had taken. David, in other words, y'all, got everything back. And all I'm going to say to you is if you are in the Lord, if you stay in the Lord, if you just stand still in Psalm 46 and 1 and know that I am God, God will give you everything that you lost. Back. But you got to stay with God. Can I get a witness in here? Put God first. Hold on to God. I'm changing hands. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Never allow yourself to allow life to get you down and discourage you. Never allow life to consume you. But if you are consumed by tribulation, you will soon go down. But if you just believe that God is a God of life and God is a God of taking care of business. Never allow circumstances to control you. Encourage yourself in the Lord. For the scripture said, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, yea, no, I walk through the valleys of the shadow of death. I shall feel no evil. Why? Because he's with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemy. And thou anointed my head with oil, and my cup running over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Whatever. Can y'all believe that? Is, that? is that something to be happy about? Can we give God praise for that? His anger is for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but if we hang in there during this coronavirus situation, joy, 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 joy will come in the morning. Encourage yourself. Amen. That's a song, my Lord. Donald Warren to be exact, that says something, sometimes you have to encourage yourself. Sometimes you have to speak victory during the test. And no matter how you feel, speak a word and you will be healed. Speak over yourself, encourage yourself in the Lord. He goes on to say, sometimes 
you have to speak the word over yourself. The pressure is all around, but God is a very present help. The enemy created walls, but remember giants. They do fall. Hallelujah. Speak over yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. And he goes on to say, as I minister to you, I minister to myself. Life can hurt you so till you feel there's nothing left. But no matter how you feel, speak a word and you will be healed. Speak of yourself. Encourage yourself in the Lord. And he goes on to say, that son, I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged in spite of what's going on, in spite of this virus. I'm encouraged. Are you encouraged? I'm encouraged. The weakness, I'm encouraged for an angel. It's for a moment, but his neighbor is for a lifeline. Weeping may it do for a night, but joy will come in the morning. Encourage yourself in the Lord.
Mr. Hoyt, we need to say something to him now, remind him of him. He would not close the communion service about drinking other wine. So we're going to do just a little bit of drinking other wine, and you all can do it at home. Drinking all the wine.